there's no codified way to teach composition. And that's why all these people, like, they come in, oh, this teacher told me that, that teacher told me this, and they have this big amalgam of all these different opinions from people. I think it's a constant journey. Like, you never figure out, okay, I learn, know how to teach composition. It's always evolving, and my teaching is always, like, changing. Actually, what, what interests me most about you, especially in comparison to my other guests, is that because I'm in New Jersey, like I'm, in the, I'm on the East Coast, got my degrees, my last couple of degrees, well, all my degrees actually were from the, the coast, LA, right. yeah. and from New York. You are just like the opposite. You have right. like, yeah. oh. why don't you talk a little bit about your background? Because it's, sure. so, it's so, so different than mine, yeah. even though we're kind of writing like, we're both writing like contemporary classical music. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, because I feel like most people think like you need to be in LA or New York. Oh, yeah. But you were right. not it's, in that yeah, camp I, at all. I, yeah. I went to the middle. <laughs> yeah. No, I grew up in New Jersey. I always had like New York kind of close by. So, you know, I would go to Broadway shows and, you know, the Met Opera. And so I always had access to that kind of culture. My dad is a filmmaker, he's a documentary filmmaker. So I, like a lot of composers, I had exposure to all the, the great film scores and, you know, that, that side of things. And then I grew up listening to a lot of prog rock and jazz. I'm a big fan of Keith Jarrett. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, me like, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, I heard the, you know, the, a couple of the solo albums, and that's sort of what got me into that. And then I kind of, the bridge took me over into classical composition and, you know, and the sort of both through film music and, and through jazz and progressive rock and sort of the big band writing thing. I saw Maria Schneider. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was in high school, the the uh, her orchestra. At, you uh, saw her live? Yes, at Birdland okay. in New York. Oh, wow. Uh, I did this like jazz workshop at William Patterson University. Saw her band and it kind of changed my life. I was like, what? Okay, you can compose this like, you know, big band music and let the improvisers kind of have their own world in your composition. That really like inspired me. So then I went to University of Miami because actually that's where that's where Maria went, and I had a bunch of friends that had gone there, uh, and so it's great jazz program. And also they had this film composition program, it was like media writing and production it was called. So I started studying the film film composition, and then some of the teachers there had started to expose me to some of the contemporary repertoire. So it was like you know Thomas Otis and Kaya Sariaho and even Donica Dennehy, some of these people, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh, cool. Okay, and Donica Dennehy is local to New Jersey, right? Too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Princeton, Princeton, right? Yeah. 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 Some of this music that I suddenly started connecting with, I always had this attitude. It's like, okay, contemporary classical is like this really inaccessible thing. But you knew about that stuff growing up in, in Jersey. Yeah. I mean, I, you contemporary know. Contemporary classical? Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'd, I'd been to the opera and I, I had heard, you know, Rite of Spring. Like my dad is a classical music guy. So he, he you know, we had the records yeah. uh, and the CD player and stuff. So I listened to all that repertoire. But I, I didn't really think, oh, I would be a composer. I thought I'd, I'd do film or I'd do jazz and play. I still do a lot of jazz piano stuff and then so yeah i went down to miami got into the classical they have great teachers down there. there's this guy lansing mccloskey who's a mm -hmm. really awesome mm -hmm. composer so i got to study with him and then he he took me on the composition path like okay this is a career you know you can go to summer festivals and you can you know go to graduate school and i was like okay i'll, I'll do this this sounds really like a viable career and i sort of moved moved away from the film thing and started doing like a lot of composers do i feel like that's kind of a common trajectory they think i want to be a film composer and then that was me too yeah, right yeah. when right. i was younger i yeah. thought well it wasn't like it was more like i didn't know that you could do concert music it wasn't like i wasn't interested i just didn't know i was interested right and, and maybe right. you were the same yes you know i thought it was an antiquated like the, being a composer like that you could make a living i, I had no idea so i, I well, was making grateful. a living is still very hard as it a is extremely as a hard composer yeah, as with a capital know. c but, yeah but you know. uh but it's doable you know and I, I always tell my students that like you can do it if you have the right tools and you have the right attitude you can do it and then i went to graduate school at rice University. I did my master's there. Great program. And it was sort of strange because they don't have any jazz there. And I was doing the jazz in undergraduate. And then I sort of stopped. I still played out in, the, in, in Houston. They have a pretty nice jazz scene. But I was doing mostly chamber works, opera, and then orchestra. Obviously, at Rice, you, you know, the orchestra program is incredible. Oh so my everyone, God, it's like the best. Yeah, It's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's still, I haven't really heard orchestras play at that level. Even some professional orchestras. It's all a bunch of old guys, right? And, I mean, we might, and, have, we might have overlooked we would have maybe overlapped at Rice because I was accepted to oh, Rice yeah, as well. You got when it, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, when around probably what years were you at Rice? Twenty fifteen to twenty seventeen. Yeah, we would have so overlapped. Probably the same. Yeah. yeah, it would have been twenty fourteen to twenty sixteen for me. Yeah, yeah. I was in between Rice and Juilliard. And Juilliard Those were the yeah. two that I, yeah. I were my top two. Yeah, good yeah. choices. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, they're good. It's yeah. a, it's it's, a, it's a hard and and also Rice gives you a ton of money. You know, they gave they you, do. They give yeah, you like all of the master students and, are fully funded. Yeah, plus a so, stipend. Like a right? stipend. Yeah. Stip- yeah, they yeah. It's a, it's hard. And, it's a hard deal to beat. <laughs> right. That's a big reason why I chose it. Yeah. And and Houston's really really great. Actually, it's a right. good city to be in. There's a lot of institutional support for composition and for arts in general. An amazing arts district. I spent a lot of time at the Manila Collection and, you know, and Museum of Fine Arts and going mm-hmm. to see Houston Symphony and Houston Grand Opera. Yeah, I had a really good time at Rice. After I did that, then I, I, I did a Fulbright in Norway, which was really fun. It was doing Norwegian jazz kind of studying Norwegian jazz and then writing my own composition that was inspired by my great grandfather who's Norwegian and this was at the Norwegian Academy of Music and then I just had a great time in Norway and traveling around and learning about the composition scene there and differences with European composition and Norwegian jazz and all that stuff and that was fantastic I want to um, before we talk about the where you went next right because I think all of this is fascinating because yeah. it just kind of breaks the what most people think you have to do to be right. a composer right I want to actually hear this uh, one of these jazz Jazz pieces that was influenced by your heritage, but sure. Norwegian heritage, Emir's Bones. Let's hear a couple minutes of it. in a way as well because i write music that deals with my like ancestry as well yeah. so i i connected with this kind of uh, sensibility as mm-hmm, well mm-hmm. so you're you're writing music like this you're going to miami then you go to you know you go to houston then where to next yeah so after i got back from from norway i took a gap year back in new jersey i did some freelance work a lot of film stuff a lot of like orchestra arranging a lot of like musical theater kind of copy yeah. work i had been working for a while with this composer named michael bacon mm-hmm. he's a film composer in new york up, upper west side and i did like sort of orchestration stuff for him he does a lot of like public score uh, public television documentaries so i was doing that and then i was applying for doctoral programs because i knew that i wanted to teach i applied to a few programs actually university of Colorado Boulder stood out to me and it's not a program you know it's not like you know USC or Michigan or it's sort of like an under the radar program and I that kind of appealed to me I'm a big hiker I had done Aspen the previous summer I was Mm -hmm. like okay I love Colorado so and I the composer Carter Pan Mm -hmm. uh, teaches there I really liked his music and they had this three-year fellowship two years of teaching and then one year of where you just get to make a piece in this black box space which actually is is the fall of man that's the piece that the second piece that I showed you Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you get a year you don't teach and you don't even take classes you just write this piece for the black box and you get all this funding and resources to make this composition this evening length and it can be whatever you want it can be you know ballet or opera or... is that something you knew before you applied to the yeah degree? i'd heard wow. about this this program yeah i've never heard about this personally before yeah, so, yeah i you... mean it, the i don't know if it's still a thing because sometimes the program changes i don't know if you can still apply for it 
Like I'm not sure if they have openings for next year, but it's a really, really unique. It's called the Atlas Fellowship. And it's through this institute called the, the Atlas Institute, which is like a multidisciplinary program. So they have like people who do coding and filmmakers and like digital art people who like put code on their body. You know how like that kind of thing was <laughs> right. like multimedia. And then the composers kind of came in and worked with these interdisciplinary people to make these pieces. But well, and this was done f uh, first, second or third year, you said? Third year, yeah. <laughs> and then you do this in your third year and then you did the degree is done after the third year or do you yeah, have a couple? Yeah, it's a three year degree, you well, know, you get science a field You delivered. get a doctorate in three years? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, cause <laughs> the math didn't add up. Cause you said you finished your master's in 2017. Yeah. I finished mine in 2016. I also took a gap How year. long was your, your doctorate? My doctorate was six years. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty typical. Like, yeah. But it was sort of an in and out <laughs> kind yeah. of deal. But let's take, um, a, let's take a listen, though, because you mentioned this piece. Sure, uh, yeah, sure. The Fall of Man and Other Tales. I pre-select the excerpt, so, so I actually <laughs> selected this one from like, it's like almost half an hour in. This is an excerpt called On the Sociology of Remote Work. I figured we, we <laughs> a lot of us connect with that. So yes. let's, let's take a listen to that. <laughs> it's great that you could do your doctorate in three years and you still get you still get that uh, teaching experience though yeah that's my, yeah, that's so my big question the first year i did oral skills the second year i did um the class composition which was on zoom because that was the covid year that right, was 2021. right same here um, yeah with the zoom classes but they let you teach your own class in the first year yeah wow yeah, yeah. so 
Wow. Well, no, actually, so the first year was, was oral skills, and the second second year was that class composition, which I could. But the oral skills was, you know, they had they had a bunch of instructors, instructors, and then the the syllabus that was sort of a shared syllabus. You know? Wow, I mean, still because like at Columbia, at least, um, what they do is they give you the first year no teaching at all, mm. and the second year you're a TA for like some random class. Like they kind of assign oh, you to okay. a, like any. Yeah. It, it's yeah. like a big list of classes. Yeah. And then at Juilliard, did you teach at all? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't teach anything at Juilliard because I was paying so much money to go there that I said that anything else I was doing besides my classes and composing was Mm -hmm. a waste of time, Mm -hmm. to be frank. The teachers that they that they had that were students like master students, they were paying them like something like it was like five grand a semester or Mm -hmm. five grand Mm -hmm. a year. I forget what either way. It's like very little money. Yeah. You know, to teach like a class, (laughs) like an oral skills class or something. And I'm like, well, the tuition's 50 grand a year, you know an income is a is not going to really yeah, change my you know, drop in the bucket yeah it's yeah, not going to really yeah. change you know my trajectories right but that time spent composing and and uh doing well there is, is yeah. better than like giving my time back if that right. makes sense yeah, that yeah, was no, my calculation does. It, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Also, I had no business teaching a class back then. I mean, I was... I'm not sure I did either. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because actually I never had oral skills. <clears throat> In my undergraduate, I had like this jazz. So at, at UM, University of Miami, they have this thing called experiential curriculum. Okay. Which is like you just go in an ensemble and play. It's really cool, actually. But I'd never had so, like solfege. Really? Yeah. And then I had to teach it. So as I was teaching solfege, I was learning movable dough solfege. Oh, my God. At the same time. I think I did okay. You know, I got my teacher reviews back. Some of them were terrible, but... <laughs> Oh but yeah, I, yeah. I'm no, learning. No, no. You know, I was my, learning. And my first year teaching at was, Columbia was yeah. awful. I had and it was comments, at 8 a.m. You know how it is. Oh yeah. yeah, I had comments saying like, "This teacher, I don't know why he I, I, he shouldn't be allowed in front of a classroom." <laughs> oh yeah, it was like, "Oh, this teacher only knows about music but nothing else." Right. It, it was comments oh, yeah. like that, and yeah. it was very it was hard. But now the comments are the opposite. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, if yeah. you you know, you, as long as you get better and yeah, and, and you know, and you right. know that you suck. If you're self-aware and you pay <laughs> yeah. attention, okay, that didn't go so well. Right. I mean, right. Try differently next yeah, time. I feel like people give up too easily. They when do. Things don't yeah, go it is well. really hard. The first time you teach, it's yeah. like you get in front of a room. You have first to time you do anything. Lecture. Yeah. yeah, it was true. Yeah, first time you compose, same same deal. Yeah, like yeah. my students. I'm sure you like this with your students, and we'll talk about that a little later. Like my students, uh, my composing students, um, especially when they first start with me, they they really feel like if their first idea doesn't work out, like that's it. Like they oh, just yeah. kind of scrap it. Yeah, they it don't stick it. with it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, no, like, actually, it's going to be when you figure out how that works, your brain is going to like, like the, you know, serotonin or whatever chemical that is, it's just going to, you're going to like catch the bug when you, yeah. when you figure out for yourself without me telling you what to do, how and, that piece is supposed to progress. And then right. you'll, you really love composing. I yeah. mean, I go, I still go through this with every piece that I write. I always have like the, the, the unwillingness to accept the first idea and like the ed- editor brain, like the annoying brain that's like constantly trying to edit things. It's yeah. always there. There and I have to turn it off and then I overcome that first hump. Yeah, there. but the, the students they don't understand that you are also going through that also. Right. Because they just assume oh, you're the authority figure, oh, you know what exactly, you yeah. know how to do things but in reality, no, we don't know how to do things either we're just right. like helping the students through our trial and error, like, oh, this is stuff yeah, I tried. Exactly. Maybe yeah. this will work for you. Teach. I mean, there's some books about teaching composition, right? But there's there's no standard way to do it. Like, there's no codified way to teach composition. No. And that's why all these people, like, they come in, oh, this teacher told me that, that teacher told me this. And they have this big amalgam of all these different opinions from people. And that's, like, <laughs> their experience learning composition. So, yeah, you like, I'm still figuring it out. I think it's a constant journey. Like, you never figure out, okay, I learn, know how to teach composition now. Right. It's always evolving. And my teaching is always like changing yeah. with the students and, you know, with the music that's coming out, coming out now. A lot of kids come in, they're interested in video game scoring, actually. Of course. That's sort of, and just so I have to like, okay, you now say, I have to teach myself that. You think it's more <laughs> video game scoring now versus film scoring? Like they're telling you yeah, video game, like yeah, they're specifically telling so. you video it, games. That's because that's I, interesting. I think so. Yeah. Because, so I teach this film music class and a lot of the students, they don't know the kind of core, you know, we have repertoire in classical music and the film repertoire, like they don't know Stanley Kubrick. 
Kubrick. They don't know Spielberg. Like they don't, like some of them maybe have heard Williams and stuff, but a lot of them, yeah, they connect with video game scores. And I don't actually know as much because I, I play some, play like N64 maybe, but that's their repertoire. That's the stuff that they know most intimately. So they come in wanting to do that. And it's a totally different skill set. I mean, learning this middleware stuff. I don't know if you've ever, so there's this um, middleware, right? Where it's like you, I don't even fully know how it works admittedly, but you know, you implement the music into the, the code of the game and like knowing how that works and knowing how to create loops and how to create uh, transitions and fades and things. And, and do thematic development in that way as opposed to the more cinematic kind of like light motif sort mm -hmm. of thing which is there in video games but it's it's a little different some you know? video games yeah yeah so yeah i have ha been having to teach myself how that works how the implementation process works and how middleware works and and that's all new to me so but i i'm excited by it like i'm interested in learning more about it and seeing yeah what but you have the skill set already where like you know how to learn things right and yeah, I feel exactly. like also that I was with a group of students, one of the places I teach, and uh, one of the things I, I told them, I was really surprised came out of my mouth, felt like I had to say it, was that the biggest thing that I feel like you guys need to learn how to do is to be curious. Mm, yeah. Which is something I, I always took for granted, you know? Yeah. Because I always yeah. feel curious. Yeah, me too. I, you know, yeah. and I think you are the same. Yeah. And most people I bring on this, whatever this show is, you know, are, are that way too. Right. So I just yeah, they like, seek it out. Right. Yeah. They just, they don't like wait for someone to tell them to do something mm -hmm. or like if they want to know something, they're like, whatever they can do to figure it out, they will do it. Mm -hmm. They will go on the internet. They will go to the library. They'll ask a friend or even right. not ask a friend. They'll yeah. like call. The, like I've done all those things. Right. And for me to see students that don't have that curiosity. Do you, do you see that um, a lot with like in person and online? The students that don't have that curiosity. Oh, um, no, I, I can't, I can't really put a percentage on it, but like I could tell immediately when yes. that, when that happens, right. when there is, when there is that lack of curiosity, mm -hmm. I, it's very mm -hmm. obvious from like the first couple of minutes yeah. talking to a student. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And that is very hard to, the, the only way I feel like you can change that is to figure out a way to inspire them. Like there's yeah. nothing that you could say, yeah. like there's no specific thing you could say to them that will change that mm -hmm. there has to be some sort of feeling that makes them change right i, I don't know how much you feel. I, i'm just yeah, kind of no, pontificating no, 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 here no, no. but I, that's I something agree. that yeah, is, like, is on my mind lately. i agree because yeah for both you and me and and a lot of the composers that have have made it they have some deep passion for some kind of repertoire it doesn't have to be and nowadays it can be anything it can be like some kind of pop production thing you know or like oh i really like you know neo soul it, it could be any genre any style yeah. just some kind of passion um, i'm looking looking for that and so with every student that I have I try to find out what that is and if there is none yeah there's there's it's really hard <laughs> like it's super hard but I keep showing the music until right, maybe gotta, they find something that they can really connect with yeah I feel like exposing is one of those ways that you can inspire yeah. without using your own words because exactly. at some point they're yeah. going to get tired of your voice exactly is what I find yeah, yeah, as yeah. well so bringing in other things helps absolutely I want to actually play another piece of yours come from Longleaf yeah. It's really cool. One hour, like completely instrument. Speaking of Berlioz, completely yeah, instrumental, yeah, right. completely narrative type of piece. But you also have a kind of a visual as well. Yeah. Uh, with it. Yeah. Some parts of it, there's a visual. So this is an excerpt called The Sawmills, which is uh, really evocative. Uh, you, you'll hear why. <laughs> Thank you. 
pieces that I hear that are this long, number one, and have it have some kind of narrative, right? And have no text. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. kind of like the yeah. holy kind of the holy grail of rarity, I feel it is, like. Yeah, it is. I mean, I do a lot of opera, so I do a lot of stuff with text, but this came this project, the Longleaf project, came as a commission from this Loop thirty eight ensemble, which is a Houston based group. Awesome kind of symphonietta new music symphonietta kind of they wanted to do a project that would engage like local east texas issues and i had been interested in kind of ecological themes you know like nature and immersion into nature and, and the history behind it when they pitched me they said oh you, you want to do a commission i had this idea for the for the longleaf project i said oh why don't we try to try to do this this piece about longleaf because I'd been hiking around Texas a lot. And I said, why don't we do multimedia? And they don't, yeah, obviously there's no singer in the group, so I can't use text. And so how do I tell a story using visuals and music just alone? And it was a challenge, but I kind of structured it based on the history of this longleaf pine tree. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of background about the longleaf piece. Longleaf pine is the original tree of East Texas, a kind of tree that actually thrives with burning, with far, everybody... Everybody sees forest fires now and they think, oh, like the end of the world, you know, like California is yeah. burning. But actually these trees, they, they thrive with fire. So um, there's a lot of prescribed burning and, and kind of ecosystem management. I, thought, I found that, that to be a fascinating story. And so I went out and I contacted the Nature Conservancy. And there's a guy there at, at this preserve who took me on a tour and he took me on this prescribed burn. So I went out with this ambisonic field recorder, my camera, and I captured all this sort of immersive footage. And I thought it would be fun to sort of integrate that into kind of uh, this, I guess, pastiche of historical footage and natural soundscapes and instrumental effects and that kind of thing and, and tell the story that way and i, I kind of i sort of uh, i like it uh one of the things i learned very early was how to tell a story without words from my dad who's a filmmaker it's a really it's a very visceral way of telling a story you know not explaining anything just seeing and experiencing stuff so it was a fun piece yeah I'm, I'm really i'm happy that loop 38 reached out to me about it it's a difficult thing to do you know like with the berlioz symphony fantastic i mean that's the most famous example uh, at least he had kind of a program note mm -hmm. explaining everything but with yours it was more like i think it was just move like movement titles yeah just you movement titles have, you didn't say like oh this is what happens here this is what happens here you just yeah. had movement titles so it was yeah. even less yeah exactly what, than what berlioz had but like you had that frame of reference Right, like you have that frame of reference. Okay, Berlioz. Okay, exactly. Did this. So yeah, and so like did knew... this. So and so did this. And there's plenty of other. Like before, I write every piece. I always make like a Spotify playlist of like inspirations. Right. You know, yeah. like a massive list. Right. And I think Symphony Fantastique was on there. But it's gotta be. Yeah. You know, like pieces that do the soundscape thing. And there's so many of those now. Textural things that like okay, I want I want the sound of a fire. Who composed fire music? Right. You know, and so I looked at all those examples and try to make my own version. Not copy but fuse it all into my own personal voice you know now, there was a guest on the show daniel ott who's a professor at fordham oh, yeah and he had yeah. a piece called like fire mountain or something like that yeah and that was all about like kind of that kind of same concept yeah, too cool. so yeah yeah fire the sea ocean uh water yeah. uh and I've, I've written pieces and... about water as well yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's the elements. The tale is all this time <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so you did colorado so it's, it's I, I think it's fascinating florida texas colorado all places i've spent very little time in i've never been to colorado actually uh, but i've spent a little bit of very little time in florida and texas so i'm very unaware of what's going on mm -hmm. musically in those three places yeah but then after so you finished uh colorado 2022 you said yeah right 22. so i finished columbia 2023 so we mm -hmm. were kind of very similar track and then you started applying to jobs like right after like when did you yeah. start applying i hit the market in the last year of my doctorate so okay I applied to maybe you know, like 15 schools something like that yeah you're probably was... applying to the same schools i was because i was on the job yes. market that i also applied to uh the university oh, my current yeah. job. <laughs> i applied to all of them you know i just yeah. threw my thing and uh, right exactly you know that's yeah, what you're too. supposed to do you yeah. probably applied to the same that you applied to like do you remember any of the places you applied to it was some some school in washington there's like okay. baldwin wallace baldwin wallace i applied yeah. to uh, yeah I, i'm forgetting some of the others but yeah i'm, yeah, I'm sure there was we applied. LSU, there was lsu, LSU I applied, yeah. yeah yeah brian neighbors got that right job. amazing yeah. Uh, yeah i made it to like semi-final or whatever i think there was university of utah yeah um, i applied to that one too yeah 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 i i went to the campus actually. oh you did I okay did, uh, nice yeah. but like i, I never remember who they ended up hiring uh some it was a lady from new york yeah I think she went to cuny i don't remember I forgot her name. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Jennifer or something. But I actually didn't find out. Uh, I didn't even know well, they didn't whether. Tell you that. No, I didn't know whether I got oh, got it shoot. or not. I actually visited with with everybody. Yeah. 
and I never got a message. And I actually found out on Facebook. Oh man! And I found like with the announcement of who. No, no, no they there was hired. no announcement. I just searched oh. like University of Utah comp. Like I just, yeah. I, I didn't even find. It wasn't even on my feed. Wow. I was just searching the internet, just yeah. looking, because it was like six months went by and I had no answer. That's rough, but that's um, pretty common actually. Is in it? Like, oh, yeah, in the I market. Thought it was, I thought it was strange that once you once you get to the final 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 round, right? There's you no rounds. You would think they would have you'd the courtesy you to. Know. You'd hope. Yeah, I just did. I did an interview at Michigan State for yeah. their, their music technology thing. Right, right. Um, and I got to, also got to the final round. But the, yeah, they were very courteous. And they, they sent an email. And they, they said within you a week, I said, yeah, like, thank you. We really loved your thing, but you know, we're going with another candidate. Oh, they told you that, and, yeah. And that's they just true. announced it last week. So so they, yeah. they were very well in advance. Then. So that that's I think that's the way it should be done. Full, clear communication, you know. Oh, but I, I, I told some of my professors at Columbia what happened. And they were like, yeah, that sounds normal. I'm like, it is normal. Which really? Is, which is, yeah. You, like The very last round? Especially, yeah, because yeah, you go and you build those personal relationships. Right, it's strange. And, you, you meet know, with the dean, like the, you meet with the, all the professors, yeah. you know, it's right. uh, fine. But uh, it was it was a weird experience. Yeah. Um, but then, you, okay, but, you got into the place you're working at yeah, now, Stephen, Stephen F. Austin, Austin University. Yeah, and I know you've, you've had Steve Lias as Steve a Lias was sitting uh, uh, right there a few months ago. Yeah, <laughs> um, so he's my colleague. And we, so, yeah, we, we get along really well. He's, he's very much into the whole wilderness music as mm -hmm. am I in a different way but so yeah we're, we're friends as well as colleagues yeah the whole process was great applying to the job and it's a good fit for me it's it's we have this very open attitude about composition and you know we do a lot of film stuff and we do you know this jazz and I'm able to do all those things and and there's no theory <laughs> which I, I very much appreciate no more oral skills for me maybe in the future who knows but it's composition only gig and, and, I, and tenure track and so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm oh so it's yeah. tenure track from yes. the from the get go yeah to track because okay. it was a new line that they made when i got hired an assistant professor of composition i'm lucky to have gotten it yeah i'm happy to be there if people have been watching this far along then they're they're invested I would assume in all this academic talk we've been talking about, yeah, but like hopefully. tenure track is basically the tenure track means that once you, uh, once you apply to that job and it's called tenure track, what that means is that you are basically, if you do all the correct steps, right, you'll basically teach there forever, right? That's right. basically it. Or yeah. like if you go to another, if you jump ship to another university, you can maintain a lot of that. Uh, yes. The, the credentials. The, the portfolio that, you, that you've built up. It's not like you're restarting somewhere else. Exactly. If you decide yeah. you want to go to some other university. Right. And yeah. the typical levels. So there's, there's assistant, there's associate, and then full professor, right? And then so if you, you know, at one institution, you're working your way up and you get associate, you can transfer that to the next institution. Right. Or you could apply for a position for associate or full professor with the credentials that you've built up in right. your tenure and with portfolio. each of those levels assistant associate full you right. get different set of benefits so you get like obviously increased salary status is a is a thing also yeah. that's a real yeah. thing that people you know whether we want to ignore it or not it's, it's a, a real, real thing totally a real thing um, academia is still in a lot of ways like the old hierarchical right. system of right yeah, you know with the adjuncts at the bottom <laughs> unfortunately right and then you have the <laughs> adjunct uh professors which have credentials most of them have doctorates i believe it's yeah. not like they don't yeah. have credentials it's just yeah. those jobs are more more for i, I call them hired guns that's the term i yes. like to use yeah. they, they're basically independent contractors that come to teach like one or two classes and they get paid like per credit right and so like you might get called in august like oh we need someone to right. teach your, you know the music appreciation yeah, yeah it's not really a sub it's like it's like the next above sub oh, yeah because you yeah. are actually teaching a full semester yeah yeah you're f teaching a full load you're not like just coming in every once in a while no you're like teaching like an actual class you have actual students yeah, right you are doing actual grading and so on but then yeah. you don't know if you have that gig necessarily the next year yeah it's not like yeah. guaranteed right yeah. whereas the tenure track job is like yes i don't have to wonder if i have a job next year right there's a security this is the job that i have unless i do something dumb or you know yeah, yeah. just and, like and you would in any me, other people job have done things dumb and not gotten tenures oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My so you can you can screw up but you just have to keep active you know that's the thing like and that's it's kind of an it's a good element of the tenure track right is that there's an incentive to keep active in the field. So to keep composing, to keep getting commissions, to keep right. doing activities and going to conferences. And, and that actually hel helps because it's sort of, it's all the same, you know, like my composition work, I love doing it and I want to keep active as a composer, but it's actually contributing to my job, my teaching job, which is really nice. Yeah. It's sort of a, it's a nice back and forth. Well, you bring things that you're learning from the field 
right? Yeah, into exactly. The, into yeah, the classroom. I'm, I'm showing my students the music I'm hearing and you yeah, know, and the things that I'm learning through composing. And, and then this this personally shocked me. I mean, maybe it's not shocking to us in this conversation, but when I was just a few weeks ago, because I'm teaching summer also at Columbia, mm -hmm. I, I don't really stop working. It's kind of <laughs> my problem. But I, I like you know workaholics. Anyway, <laughs> uh, one of the students in my class, she went up to. Uh, I think we were taking the subway at the same time. It was right after class, so she's talking to me, I'm, and I asked, and she knows a lot of things about me, and I'm like, how how do you know all these things about me? Yada yada. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I look you up. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, oh, you know, when we when we search for uh, teachers to teach this class, mm. like we, the students, we look you guys up. Mm -hmm, I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I don't see any reviews of my teaching online because occasionally I go on rate my professor. Right. I don't have a. And she said, no, you know, we see your YouTube, we see your Instagram. You see, yeah. Excuse me, you guys do yeah, that? No, they, I they had do. no idea. They do. I yeah. really didn't because in all the classes I teach, nobody ever mentions it. Right. Mentions that that I do any of those things. So I don't, I don't mention it either Yeah. until maybe the last class I say, oh, you know, I, I also teach composers, you know, and this and that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, some of them care, some of them don't, most yeah. don't care, you know? So I just don't mention it, you know? Right. This lady was a student of mine. She was telling me, no, we look. And, uh, the reason I'm in your class is because you have a presence and you're doing oh, okay. stuff outside yeah. of the nice, university. Though. Yeah. That's like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't, right. I didn't, I always separated my life. Yeah teaching at an academic institution like right. i always yeah. think thought of that as a separate thing yeah. never thought of it as anything that relates to anything i do here uh, but what you're saying is no it actually yeah, is no it is totally, is totally it's like a reciprocal thing right when i went to study composition i knew i wanted to work with certain teachers and i knew, right. knew about them online like so it's it's similar but it's cool that even in those bigger classes there's people that want to take the class because it's cool it's like oh a cool professor you know he's doing all this cool stuff he's out there in the world and yeah, they but, want to see but that they don't yeah. know what it really they don't know what it means because these people these kids are um they're not musicians, so they don't mm. they don't they don't really know what, yeah, what like, exactly I'm doing in relation to other people, right? They just see that and they yeah. say, okay, they put some kind of value on that, which is interesting to me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I try. I mean, I try to. I want to. I want to be inspiring to my students. Like, if I feel like if I'm not doing things, and I'm just like a professor who's just sitting there and teaching and only teaching. It's like. I don't have anything to teach. You yeah, know, I don't have I, anything I, to I, share. I, I, I said this actually yeah. to a private student of mine a couple of days ago. We had a lesson online and um, this came up actually. Uh, he was asking me, oh, you're doing all these things because I was, he wanted to know more what I do besides mm -hmm. yeah. teaching. So how are you able to do all these things? I said, oh, I, first of all, I love doing all these things. There's, right, not, right. there's no part of it I don't like doing, you know. Some of the things like editing the videos and things like that, like I don't mm -hmm. do those anymore because I, I, I really don't enjoy doing that. I have mm -hmm. somebody else to find. The teaching and all that stuff and the composing is great you know and i tell him that you know part of my me says if the composing uh, stops that the the teaching is dead it's 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 death just just to be teaching absolutely yeah, yeah. so you agree with that yeah, as totally 100 well. percent. yeah and i and uh, you know not to badmouth any anyone but i see some colleagues not just at my university but other universities right where the professors have just given up and they only teach and they've got their you know their tenure and they've got yeah. their retirement account and they're like i'm done right and it's like why like you're you're giving up such a huge part of your life, and like I and maybe it's an old school way, but I feel like you can't really teach anything without doing it actively. Because like, how are you gonna know? Even if you're teaching voice or instrument, like, how are you gonna know? Yeah, how the field is evolving and how the, these new perspectives are informing how you can do your craft if you're not active. Yeah, I mean, I've also noticed with some teachers, um, depending on their activity too, like they think that the field works like how it did. 30, 40 exactly, years ago. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, and I hear crazy stuff like, oh, you just have to write good music and you, people will notice mm -hmm. you. Maybe that was the case 40 years ago, but that's not the case right now. Mm -hmm, there's a mm -hmm. ton of like, you're writing amazing music, right? But there's lots of people out there that would love to hear what you're writing, but they were just not aware of it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And because of what we have today, we can do that if you're, if you're, you know, you, you have to plan it though. It's not going to happen yeah. like yeah, it's serendipitously, right? It has exactly. to be very deliberate and yeah. very calculated. Yeah. And people don't like to say those words out loud, deliberate mm -hmm. and calculated. No composing is just about the being yeah. in the nature inspiration, and inspiration and, yeah, walking and all this and, bullshit you yeah, know yeah it's not uh and yeah. it never was either you know it never yeah. was that way either no it wasn't it was <laughs> always a, a, a business and you know always. it's maybe cynical but the, yeah again no it's not it's cynical all... that's that's the that's actually it's uh freeing it because is you yeah. know what it is you're not yeah. ignoring it if you're 
if you're tackling it head on, you say that's what it is, and you are willing to work in that system, mm -hmm. it's actually liberating. But if you're fighting against it all the time, right? It's it's really only that's it's tough. Like that romantic vision of the composer that, but like. I think about like those Renaissance, you know, like the Renaissance guy, like Josquin de Pre, right. like, just serving the court and doing all the right social interact, you know, like all these just, yeah. But like that's, that's what they were doing. Right. Josquin yeah. and Dufay had major beef, you know. Yeah, yeah. With those guys in the Renaissance and even before, you say, you know, there was this famous, I don't know if you know this uh, story about uh, Josquin and Dufay, that there was this like wealthy family that wanted to hire uh, Josquin. And mm -hmm. Josquin said, oh, my fee is 300 Duca, or whatever it was, yeah, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. And then Dufay says, and then Justin says, no, that's not, that's, that's not enough. You know, if you, if you want it for that price, go ask Dufay. Mm, then they mm. went and asked Dufay. <laughs> Dufay did the thing for that price. Then they went back to Justin. We'll pay you what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll pay you what you <laughs> want. It's always been that way. Exactly. It's yeah. always been that way. And, yeah. it, and it really uh, grinds my gears, especially people in academia, not mentioning those things. Oh yeah. Because, because they also have this whole thing where yeah. they have a system mainly uh, powered by uh, interest on on the endowment that they're mm -hmm. working with, right? Because every university has a big endowment. They exactly, all get in yeah. five, six percent a year. Yeah. And that's where the money comes from for yeah. their for their salaries. Yeah. So they are in the system as well. Yeah. No Whether matter they like it or not. Exactly. No, but I mean a lot of these professors they, they don't they're not open about how they got to where they are. And yeah, as you said, the way that they got to where they are is so different. Like if imagine applying to a job in like 1980, there one, there are way fewer composers and there's not as much of the consideration of the issues that we have now, right? Like diversity and all these different things and, right. and the online presence. And so when, to be a composer back in 1980 or 70 and get a job, you just write your music, have a great portfolio, get some performances and you can get an academic job, but that it's not the way it is now. And so we, 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 I guess, gear our composition program towards that kind of thinking. So we've got entrepreneurship classes. We've got like, I, we make sure that the students are really well-rounded. And so when they go out, they can, they know what the options are and they know what they have to do to build their presence. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they do it or not is another question, but, but we try to push, we try to, you know, give them the tools and the resources that we think that they need. And as we've said, like the only way to do that is to be active in the field. Because if I'm just rotting away in my office and not understanding, okay, well, here's this YouTube channel, here's, you know, here's different pub publishing models, all the stuff that you do on your YouTube channel. Right, like, right, right. Without understanding that, that they're going to graduate and they're going to get a job at Burger King or, or you know, <laughs> not not be in the field. And Although I don't think there's anything wrong with getting a job like that. There's uh, not. Starting yeah, out, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't mean to, I don't mean to yeah. like, you know, diminish. I mean, I worked in retail for a while. I worked in my gap year. I worked at Staples because I thought, oh, I'm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy, you know, I'm gonna, I know how to copy scores and I know how to print stuff so I, I can work at the copy print center at Staples. And, and it, yeah, I, I, yeah, I learned a lot by doing that. And yeah, I mean, I have, yeah. I have students that are from all walks of life. I have one guy that uh, works at a, I think a dog day resort, like a dog resort, yeah. like a dog daycare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this guy is like so passionate about composing and right. it's always a pleasure. He comes on the calls and, and he's very passionate about what oh, he's nice. doing. And it's like, divorced from any like okay this is a commission this is a this is a something i gotta get done by yeah, next week yeah. like it's just like pure love for it's like you know people <laughs> it's like people that play golf like not to equate composing with golf but it's like the we have a golf course across the street so that's the oh, thing nice. i'm thinking yeah, of yeah. these people when they play golf there's not one hair follicle on their head that thinks they're going to be the next tiger woods right 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 they're yeah, literally right. doing it they're spending all this time and all this money and all these resources right yeah to play golf but they have no they, they there's no like it. ambition yeah. to like make it a career right but they love it they mm. can't stop talking about it they'll yeah. watch the golf tournaments on tv they'll talk with their friends about golf like without any you know inclination yeah, that this will be or, something yeah. that is viable f as a career right so why why can't composing be like that I, that that yeah. has always been a question mark in my mind yeah. You know, like, why can't composing be like that as well? You know, there's nothing wrong with having a real job and then composing on no, the side. No, it's true. And again, what, the what's historical wrong with that? precedent shows that that's very possible. They yeah, what's Ives wrong with that? And, you know, yeah. These people, yeah, this whole academic thing that we've been part of, which is fine. It's That has its own, like, you've been able to do this, these couple of one hour long pieces, which are mm -hmm. you cannot really do on your own. Those are really, those are very expensive to pull off on your own. They are. you're able to do yeah. it with yeah. attachment to the universe. That's amazing. Right. The, the that's a great thing. The institutional support and the grant funding. 
and that's all that great stuff. Yeah, yeah. right but like for all these other people that don't have that like what's their reason to compose mm-hmm. so i mean these are things that are in i'm i'm you are the my subject there so <laughs> no, no, sorry. no no yeah no i totally I but totally these are things on my you. mind like why yeah. can't like a normal nine to five or person compose music mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. way that you see these um i see these even in my in the, the town next ne- next door I forgot the town's name but there's this place called like art by by ann something mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. And it's just a little shop where, you know, people get together and paint for an hour a day yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And there's an instructor and they have, yeah. they don't, none of them think they're the next, uh, you know, Monet. Right. You know? You're, right. Yeah. No, it's totally true. We have a lot of master's students that are, that are like this. They, well, they get their master's almost for fun, which seems like kind of a weird proposition, you know, like, but they, they, they're like a, they they do something else. They're like a band director or they work in another field and they want to seriously pursue composition in some other way. So they come and do this online master's program. Mm. And it's so fun. I love, those are my favorite students. You know, the students that they're, they're like very well-rounded, they've traveled, they've, they have another job in another field and they can afford it. And they are interested in a lot of different things. And then they bring all that to their music and it's another, another side to it. You know, sometimes composers, they're so, they're in their own world and they're you know music about music about music about music you know oh, I'm, I'm definitely like that yeah yeah I, I, I don't admit I, I mean I admit it you know and I uh, can be too yeah yeah we all can yeah. yeah but having that yeah having those people constant in our field that are breathing new life from different air er- different angles is so good I think it's really healthy keeping the, the boundaries really porous and not gatekeeping and, and the fact that you have that attitude as a as a professor too is really a great sign also. Yeah, not everyone does. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah. academia, it, it can be tough sometimes. But well, st- yeah, Steve Steve Lias does too, and I think we both we, we try to embody that with the way we teach. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Steve is a great guy, and I've been keeping up with him for many many years since I met him, 2017, I think, mm-hmm, when I mm-hmm. I met him in China actually. Oh no! Oh yeah, modern, the ISCM uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, the International yeah. Society of what Contemporary, Contemporary Music, music yeah. right? And we just did that. And you're involved with that too now. Yeah, yeah. Just this. First... Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a very interesting yeah, part yeah, of your life as well. Yeah, this is my first year going. This year it was in the Faroe Islands, which is okay. kind of, it's like in between, it's like, yeah, between Norway and Iceland. Beautiful country, but very, very cool. The way they run it, it was very like aesthetically open. Mm-hmm. And so we, yeah, we, we kind of run this call for scores within Texas, composers that are interested in having a piece. Mm-hmm. And we choose a number of pieces and then the ISCM uh, delegation chooses which ones they're going to program from that pool and it's very cool it's sort of like a un so they they have this big room where all the composers from different countries are meeting and talking about issues and voting um, next year it's going to be in portugal which is very cool and so you you had an orchestra piece right that was done or something in china was, yeah, yeah yeah frank oteri who was oh, yeah. who was the big uh well he was the one that like started the new music box yeah. magazine he heard my um one of my pieces back in 2017 he was at a reading milwaukee symphony i think something like that and uh he heard that an aco thing American no composers? no no it was uh it was a separate thing oh, that milwaukee okay. was it didn't it didn't last very long oh I see okay. uh, but it was at the it, yeah milwaukee symphony and it was stephen schick conducting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this big big name in the percussion field right right but he's also a great conductor so he conducted the piece frank Terry was there in the audience and he he like he went up to me and he loved the piece he wanted to interview me and all this stuff so i did this new i did the interview it's still up there on new music box and uh, he, he said he wanted that piece to represent the u.s mm. like all of the u.s for the symphonic no pressure. category <laughs> said, excuse me can you find somebody <laughs> yeah. a little more that's seasoned awesome, for though. this no, frank, yeah. frank is so, that guy knows so much music yeah it's that's insane. what i that's what i was He's thinking like a, too so i mean you 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 scored well in his book that's I what guess. i was saying because <laughs> when he good. was telling me like when i was talking to him i could tell he knew a lot oh, of music yeah, so yeah. and he like he has the entire history of the iscm concerts right, like right. memorized like in his head so he's like oh in 1971 it was in you know brussels and whatever like he'll remember like no, but exactly his, but also his the, the his music catalog exactly yeah is in, in not just classical music yeah, all I mean, genres. he knew like about yeah. like I was mentioning some like Arabic singers yeah. from like the 19, like the early 20s. He knew all these people. I'm like, how do you mm. know these people? Yeah. yeah. So the fact that he selected my piece, I was like, really, yeah, really, yeah, was... I didn't really know what to think, you know, at the time. But I just, right. you know, just, well, that's good. Just take it. Music and, is, is good. <laughs> uh, back then. It holds well, up with you. Yeah. I think it's a little better now, but back then I didn't think it was any good. I was just, I was just figuring shit out. Right. But little know? things like that, they can really give you a nice boost. Little you things know? like that, yeah, you know, like... little things like that help a lot. Yeah. Uh, because it gives you a little validation. I'm not going to lie. That's true. 
Yeah. Uh, and you need a little bit of that, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. As not, you go. not so it gets to your head, but just pushes you out the door. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, and there will be dips, too. There yeah. were a lot oh, of big dips. Time. Big yeah. time. And, but so people, many dips. <laughs> people only see these. You know, I know. Pe- people only see these parts. Yeah. They don't see the dips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, you, yeah, yeah. you had a video where you had the rejection letters. Oh, right? I got, you know, I, I made that video. I got so tired of people telling yeah. me that you did this and you're that. I'm like, I was getting a lot of comments from people and even colleagues of mine saying, oh, you're, you know, you're doing great, this and that. And I'm like, you don't really, you see the stuff, you see that stuff, fine. But there's a lot of stuff in the back end you don't see. Yeah. So I thought it, I put it onto myself to show it, you know, because I keep track of all this stuff. Right. You know, I'm very, like I said, deliberate yeah, and calculated. Do. Right. So I show it all the stuff in the video. And it was just like one of these stupid, like, uh, videos where I'm just listing all the things <laughs> I lost, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and, uh, I thought it was fun, and so I just posted it. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's one thing that's it's like I try to give hope for my students, and I don't know. I feel like that's it's one way to do that, like to, to just be really open. Like during the lesson, I say like I just got rejected to this thing. I, like I'll tell my students like everything that I'm doing, you know, that I'm like, and just the the kind of raw emotional side, which which can be you know a blessing and a curse because then they get to see this like you know like person who's having the same emotions that vulnerable. they are yeah the vulnerability the word, right yeah yeah, sure. yeah yeah thank you for the for that word yeah but, yeah no i i i agree i mean that took me a long time to figure out as well that that was okay yeah. like nothing bad happened to me when i started opening yeah. up yeah, yeah yeah it was actually the opposite right if this is if this is what you know it connects with people then that's what i'll do maybe it's a little uncomfortable but after you do it a few times it, yeah. like you just yeah. like you don't even care it's like all right uh, the people that like you are going to like you and the people that hate you which right. there are lots of <laughs> oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're going to hate you no matter what so okay fine well it's when you start getting the negative reviews that's how you know that you made it you've moved beyond your friends you know that or you, you're on your way to making it you know like your friends are going to be oh this is great this is great but then when you get those negative press reviews and those negative youtube comments and those negative you know oh it's and we've fine. all gotten those and it's it's like that's you know you've reached a wide enough audience where people start but, not but you liking want, you. But, but, you, but you want that you, you want, do want you it. want yeah. that um you want that interaction yeah. you want to elicit a feeling like what we're doing as composers we're trying to elicit feelings right yeah. no matter how abstract those feelings are whether no matter how abstract the aesthetic is right i mean that's what we're trying to do at exactly, the end of the day yeah. elicit some kind of feeling the worst thing is like you listen to a piece of i mean i'm sure you you know yeah you, you listen to a piece of music you're like okay you know whatever yeah. and just move on like right. that's the you worst just ignore it yeah yeah that's the worst but th- that's gonna happen also you know right so now you're at this university for now f- two three years right uh going into my third year yeah going into your third year mm-hmm. okay so you're kind of are you gonna do your three-year review yeah the mid-tenure review yeah yeah so every year we do this like end of end of year tenure review where we compile all the stuff that we've done you know basically you sort of import your cv and, and then you add other like engagements that you've done you basically get you know get reviewed in front of the, the tenure committee or the tenure yeah. promotion committee they you know they, they assess your project uh, progress i think i'm yeah. doing fine <laughs> well we'll see though it is kind of nerve-wracking it's a lot of work uh, to yeah, put this, yeah, yeah 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 no it sounds like you're doing great you know and um and i i mean i i personally like the music and um Thanks. i think that you have a you know particular style that you believe in and also, I like the idea that you're still doing this jazz thing. Like your your jazz thing is like. I mean, we didn't talk much about it, but the jazz thing is it's can be its own it, yeah thing. Yeah. But you're also doing the classical stuff, which I find very yeah. Very I try interesting I try to keep active doing. with yeah. the jazz. And there's a lot of composers that are doing that now that you yeah. know, they're not afraid to continue to to do the jazz. And, yeah, and I've had a lot of composers sitting in that seat. Alex Paxton. I don't know if you know that name mm-hmm. or uh, Philip Golub. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. He's yeah, great. That, yeah. that are like, kind of like you in a way. I yeah. mean, they're very different aesthetically from you, but right. they are into writing the jazz stuff. They, they know how to exist in that idiom. And they also know, like, if you ask them to write a piece for orchestra, they know how to do they that do too. It. Yeah. 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 And I was very deliberate about that too. And actually I think that helped me on the job market, keeping active with a, a with a wide range of things Yeah, really at a lot of universities, but especially small universities, it can be a real asset, right? Cause if you can teach jazz piano and jazz arranging, that's like another side. And also obviously I deeply love it. So I'm not just doing it for the job prospects, but I had teachers that would sort of say, Oh, you know, like maybe, you know, don't do the jazz as much focus on the classical. And I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing it. And I think it paid off just that versatility, you know, and the film stuff too. I still do film music being able to teach it. And as we've said, like keeping active in that area, 
it enables you to have the tools to teach it. Yeah, but that's the key so. thing, what you just said before, that you really do like doing exactly, those activities. Yes. And you're not just doing it for the job because exactly. you could easily said, oh, I'm going to be like an expert Max MSP guy so I can teach uh, electronic music or whatever you could have said, but you would hate it. You would, you know, yeah. as an example, I don't know if you would. Oh, no, no, no. no. Yeah, I mean, I, not, I do not. Enjoy Max that yeah, much. Yeah, but, like, but, yeah, like but you the... could have said, hey, you know, a teacher could have told you, oh, you need to be really good with those kind of things. Exactly, otherwise, yeah. you won't get a job. If you had that sort of advice, like what path would you be down now? Right. It would be very frustrating. And and that yeah, to me is when... Yeah, it's not sustainable. Yeah, that to me is when things start to get cynical. That right. that part yeah. of it is when like you've been told something very specific to do, but mm -hmm. doesn't really apply to what our field is like right. now. That to me yeah. is where the cynicism comes in. Right? And I think rightfully so. Yeah, and I think, I, I, again, I try to encourage my students to just cultivate those really specific personal interests that they absolutely love and that they could think could sustain them for like 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Could you imagine yourself 30 years still, you know, playing jazz or, you know, whatever it is, interested in folk music from Armenia? I don't know. It could be anything, right? Like any specific musical tradition or interest. Just keep doing that. And then it's going to find its way into your work. And then, you know. Right. Do you ask yourself, like, what, what are you going to do in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Do you yeah, have all, this the kind of, yeah all the time. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm increasingly yeah. doing that more. Right. And now I'm starting it's to the, ask my students the same question. Yeah. And, and then like actually taking those, it's like that thing where you have the 10 year plan, the five year plan, and then the next year plan. And like just taking the steps to like, okay, what do I need to do to get to that place? And then breaking it down further. And yeah. I, you know, I used to never believe in that. Um, really? Yeah. I was like, yeah, for a long time. It wasn't until like maybe the last, it wasn't really until I started with a YouTube channel actually, like 2021 or something, 2022, where I was like, all right, I need like a plan. Yeah. You know, I yeah. never really, I just kind of just did, all right, I feel like writing this piece. I feel like going to yeah. this school. I, I, honestly, that's how it was. I was just, let me just do my best. And then, yeah. but then I realized that if you keep doing that, like you're going to burn out. Like if you don't have like some kind of goal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's like a give and take, like you got that structure, but then if there's no porousness or room for, you know, like other things and opportunities, right. It's going to be really hard and rigid, you know? So you always have to like, okay, this path can go that way. And then what does that mean? And this path could, I think a lot about that. Like, Oh, what if I had studied jazz and gone, gotten a doctorate in jazz? Or what if I had moved to LA and yeah, now and that we're getting older, we can, we are, we could be asking these kind of yeah, questions. The old man. <laughs> yeah the regrets of an old man <laughs> but it is it is this? it is kind of crazy though because um now i find myself saying no or ignoring things yes way it's way easier it is now. easier now because yeah. now i'm like well well this opportunity or this whatever this person is asking of me right is it going to help me with xyz things that i'm thinking about for the next four or five years and if the answer is no i just you just don't i, I don't yeah. even like put any emotional stock into it that's maybe good. maybe yeah. it's a little harsh you know but you know there's not hurting anyone you know i'm just right. trying to save myself no it's true yeah you know? I only have so much time right. i've been saying a lot no to certain things now too when because i, I like to travel just mm -hmm. for the sake of traveling like yeah <laughs> i like to go and you know hike and experience nature with with my with my girlfriend maggie you know we, we go out and we do stuff i deliberately i want to leave room for that like that's such an important part of my life so i say no to a lot of things for that reason like i know i'm traveling that month that yeah. counts as like a, not as like a professional thing, but it's like, that's my life. Right. I can't that's... do this obligation because I'm going to be traveling. You know, yeah, I'm going to yeah. be doing all this I stuff. I struggle a lot with this. Yeah, it can and, be hard. Yeah. 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 And my, my wife actually, she's the one that uh, pushes me to uh, keep those things in mind. Like, Good. hey, you know, yeah. we can, let's go horseback riding. I'm like, really? Should we go horseback? Yeah, you'll have fun. And then I go, oh, this was fun. I'm glad I did this, yeah, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's yeah. good to have it is. that as well. Yeah, it's good to yeah. have a partner who, who does that, who yeah. pushes you out of that yeah, absolutely. comfort zone. Well, this was a lot of fun, man. Thanks yeah, for coming Yeah, no, thank over. you for having and, me. I'm uh, glad I could make it out. Yeah, absolutely. 